that would be helpful. We'll get started here. All right, KT, if you want to go ahead and let in our guests. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, for those of you that are already in the room, we are gonna go ahead and play a wonderful video from a collaboration between the School of Aviation um, and OSEARCH and MSRI about their time up in Nova Scotia. Please enjoy this. We're just gonna give all of our participants a few more minutes to join. Um, and if you would go ahead and please turn your cameras on and rename yourself. Um, that is a security precaution we are taking with our new online virtual format. Um, we are asking guests to remain muted um, for the entirety of today's call until the end for Q&A. Um, we have the chat function available for anybody that would like to drop in a question for any of tonight's moderators. You can either send it privately to the group or ask it openly um, and we will present that. So without further ado, I will open up this video and please enjoy. We look forward to getting started soon. My name is Megan Vertalen. I'm a student at Jacksonville University. I'm an aviation management major and we're in Nova Scotia flying drones to help tag sharks. We've been trying to use the drones to scout out the area for sharks and shark habitat and be able to call out sharks before they're hooked. We are looking through sharks using the Mavic. Um, it's a drone with the polarized lens and what we're doing, we're going to about 100 feet in the air, looking 90 degrees down and looking in the shallow water slash deep water where the seals are and see if the sharks are coming up to the deep water. We've seen a lot of seals, we've seen hundreds of them, just a lot of colonies up and down the island. One of the highlights that we've had was we were able to actually capture video of one of the sharks on the bait. They have a tremendous aviation school at JU, and oftentimes planes or drones can be very helpful. So when we were meeting with them, we said, hey, if you can come up here and you can help us find where the seals hauled out or spot a shark for us and maybe help us get an additional shark or two on an expedition, that would be tremendously helpful because the average cost of finding and capturing one of these animals is over a hundred grand and every single animal that they find for us drives that cost down. It's been a dream come true with being privileged uh, enough to be on the boat and see all that go down. It's been truly remarkable, really, really incredible. To do a huge conservation research project like this, you've got to have people from all disciplines, marketing and business and, and aviation and marine science and all, all kinds of different people that come together to do what they're best at. I've learned a lot about uh, the drones and how they operate and how to pilot them correctly. They are incredibly sophisticated. Launching them from the island has been really, really interesting. It's a totally different operation when you launch them from solid ground compared to when you launch them from a moving vessel like, like the Osearch vessel. When we're on the boat, we have to launch them via hand, and that sometimes can be a lesson in frustration because it's uh, all the sensors are going off and these drones are really sophisticated nowadays. As a student, this is incredible. It's real life experience. It's, it's great conversation, especially when you're looking at new jobs. Having this kind of experience is, is really cool and, and it's great to be a part of a project like this to, to be able to do some good, but it's also great real life experience and easy to apply to, to our job market.
Welcome to tonight's um, virtual homecoming and family weekend programming. My name is Marianne Jolly and I am the director of alumni and family engagement here at the university. We're very excited to have the School of Aviation online this evening, as well as a couple special guests that you'll get to be introduced to this, this evening to talk about not only the aviation industry, but also what it's like to be a student right now um, during the School of Aviation in this COVID era. So without further ado, I am going to pass it off to the School of Aviation Director, Captain Matthew Tuey, um, and let him give you a State of the Union. Captain? There we go. Now that we've tested the mute button and it works, thank you, Marianne, and thank you to everyone for joining us tonight. I'm here to give you the state of the School of Aviation, and in a word, it is spectacular. You can go to the next one, please. There we go. I'll tell you, the thing uh, that every, it's on everybody's mind, the elephant in the room, if you will, is COVID-19. So I want to start with a quick update on that. One of the uh, things that we're very most proud of is we were one of the very, very few collegiate aviation programs in the nation that did not shut down throughout the pandemic. <clears throat> that was because of a lot of hard work on the L3 Harris uh, side of the uh, fence at the flight center and on the JU side. Some very, very strict precautions at the flight center, daily sanitation multiple times a day, uh, social distancing, restricted access, masks at all times, including the aircraft, and, uh, and different things like temperature checks and fogging the airplanes and sanitizing after each flight. We've been very, very successful. And I'm telling you about half the students that were able to, half the students that it could stayed and flew, and they flew a lot during those summer months. We really got some great work out and some, uh, and some great things done for the students. We were also able to do the same thing in our jet uh, transition course in the simulator on campus, we got dispensation for that using a lot of the same protocols that we used at the flight center. And again, I can't say enough about L3 Harris, our flight provider, and what a great partner they were, not only throughout all the transitions for the COVID-19 precautions, but also uh, just in their daily operations. Things have, uh, have improved immensely out there over the last couple of years. Uh, talking about partnerships, uh, we've got two great ones. Uh, first, I'll talk about, uh, not, in, not just because Nancy's here, but we've been in the JetBlue University Gateway Program since I believe the inception about, nine, about 2007. We're one of seven universities there, and, uh, and we joined the Delta Propel Program last year, and we're one of nine universities there. Both these programs are absolutely unbelievably great for the students, and I'm sure Nancy will talk about hers when it's her turn, but, uh, but the key is that it's tough to get in, but if you do get in, you've got the student will have a qualified job offer prior to graduation. That means they've got a defined path to the cockpit of a major airline in very, very short periods of time. So it's a spectacular set of partnerships that we have. Uh, we also have uh, students in most of the regional airlines programs. And as they, uh, they come back up online after the current uh, situation, I'm sure we'll have even more. I'll talk about that in a second. The reason we're going to have even more is our numbers are way up this year. For this fall semester, we have 239 students in the, uh, in the, in the program, about 184 AVO majors, flyers, and 55 uh, smart uh, articulate aviation management majors. We brought in 83 new students for this fall semester. Put it in a little bit of perspective, when I came back about six years ago, we had about 120 students total. So uh, through a lot of work on uh, our associate director, Alik Melchiona's part, who is our primary recruiter, uh, the state of the industry, the pilot shortage, our partner programs, a lot of different things, none of which I can take credit for, but the program has grown considerably in the last six years. We've got some big changes out at the airport too at the flight center. Uh, the first one, for those that haven't been around for a while, may not recognize the name L3 Harris. It used to be Aerosim. Before that, it was uh, Delta Connection Academy. Before that, it was uh, Tom Air Aviation Academy. But uh, that same partnership with the same base company as it changed ownerships has gone through some major transitions in the last year. 
Our new base manager, who you can see in the lower left-hand corner of your screen on the left-hand side is a gentleman named Chris Crutchfield. He's a graduate of our program in 2016. Although not pictured, our flight training standards manager is Mr. Connor Haas, who graduated a year after Chris. So having two alums running the flight program out there is absolutely, it, it's hard to quantify how great it is for the students because the leadership really, really understands what the students are going through because they went through it not so long ago. About a year and a half ago, uh, L3 started a program and they're complete now, transitioning all the aircraft to new aircraft that are all Garmin G1000 equipped, the Cessnas and the Seminoles. Uh, no more serious aircraft, they all went back to Sanford. But obviously that uh, required some, uh, some things on our side, which I'm sure Captain Ziskel will talk about since he was the prime mover in changing over our systems courses to support that. Uh, we've got some uh, changes to the faculty too. Uh, Professor Chad Kendall, who many of you will remember, moved on about a year and a half ago out to Colorado. Talked to him a few weeks ago and he's doing well, loving life out there, although it was snowing the last time we talked to him in the spring during the uh, regionals for his flight team out there. And it was you know, 85 here. But in his place, we were able to hire Dr. Angela Masson, unbelievably qualified and what a wonderful addition to our program. She started this semester. She's got a PhD in uh, aerospace safety and systems analysis. And as you can see, she brings a wealth of uh, experience from a career in American Airlines, including uh, being the uh, Miami based uh, chief pilot. She's uh, got, you know, flight time and then all those airplanes you can see and she is an absolutely wonderful addition. Uh, flight team. Uh, we are going to compete in regionals this year, although it's not going to be this semester. Right now, NIFA, uh, the National Intercollegiate Flying Association, has moved the uh, regionals to the spring, and we're still trying to figure out whether we're going to do that virtually with some flying down in Polk County or everybody go down there. I mean, we're going to do we're going to do something, and hopefully, we'll finish in the top three, and then we'll be able to go to. However, they're going to do it for nationals up in Oshkosh or here or there or wherever. But uh, we're very happy to do that. And another change coming uh, for uh, that you may or may not know about is we're starting a master's program, Master of Science in Aviation Leadership. Uh, we put together about a year and a half ago and got all the approvals through SACS and uh, that type of thing. We'll eventually be getting uh, accreditation uh, through our Aviation Accreditation Board International. That'll be a few years down the pike once we get a few classes taught. But we're going to be starting that off uh, in an online format in the fall of uh, 2021. So that's, uh, we're very excited about that. And we're very much looking forward to, uh, to moving on to the next level of uh, aviation education. There, there you go. And our new toys. Uh, through the generosity of a, uh, of a donor, we were able to acquire two Redbird simulators, which we now have, have in a uh, former office within the building right across the, uh, right across the building. Uh, they're configured uh, to, uh, to replicate our new 172s with the Garmin G1000s. And as you can see, it's still a little bit of a stark room, but uh, we're working on uh, buffing that up as well. But I wanted to put a picture of our installation here. Uh, the students are, are using them a lot. Uh, you know, to augment their, uh, their systems training and uh, an intro to aviation automation and practice to, uh, to do a lot of, uh, you know, just some extra flying to, uh, to build their proficiency. Eventually, we'll be folding them in, in a more formal way into the curriculum. But for now, uh, they're used in the students' use, uh, tutors use them, and we anticipate that the flight team will be doing a lot of their practice on them as well. So we're very uh, we're very grateful to our donor and we're very grateful to Ms. Andy Tutt, who's also on the, on the call tonight, who's our representative for uh, advancement uh, for the College of Business. She was, uh, matter of fact, I wouldn't say she was instrumental. It wasn't for her, we wouldn't have gotten them. So thank you very much, Andy. Moving along to our, uh, the one most people know about, the uh, CRJ 700 flight training device. Uh, it's been around since uh, about 2013. We use it for jet transition, obviously, our advanced systems courses and uh, cockpit resource management courses. Uh, it's, done, it's done great over the last seven years, you know, but we're talking about 10 years or a little bit more old technology. It's Windows 7 based. You know, some of the, uh, some of the 
actual hardware is uh, getting a little worn, so it's time to uh, to give us a uh, you know a technology refresh, if you will, for the computer side and some refurbishment for the uh, for the actual cockpit installation. So we've uh, we've gone out for an estimate of what it's going to take to do that, um, and we're estimating it's going to be around eighty thousand dollars. So we're starting a campaign to uh, to raise the money to to upgrade that. You know, that's one of the things that really differentiates our program uh, from a lot of other programs in the, uh, in the nation, especially smaller programs. Now, obviously, you would expect the big, huge programs to have a simulator of that caliber, but we really stand out when you talk about a, uh, a program with 240 students having that great asset. So we're gonna be asking uh, our alums, our families, our friends, strangers on the street, whoever we can get a hold of to help us uh, reach that goal when we get uh, when we get our final quote what it's going to take a uh, good example i mean you know right now to give you that image that you can see out of the cockpit in the picture uh, on the slide uh, requires four computers uh, four different systems all integrated and everything that's all done with one pc now so when we get that we'll be uh, we'll really have a streamlined system a lot more capabilities and we're uh, we're very excited about the prospect our goal is to hopefully uh, raise the funds and be able to do that upgrade uh, next summer. So we'll be ready to go for the fall semester of 2021. And I think that uh, can completes my set of things. So now this is my favorite part of this. I get to introduce our first guest tonight, Dr. Nancy Hocking. Uh, as I mentioned, we're accredited by the Aviation Accreditation Board International, or, or ABBI. And, uh, you know, part of that uh, involves not only, you know, having your own program up to speed, but going to a couple of Abbey meetings a year and participating on visiting teams and everything. And I remember my first Abbey meeting I went to about six years ago, one of the very first people I met was a, uh, was a wonderful young lady then named Nancy Shane, who uh, was working for Cape Air. Since then, uh, Nancy became Nancy Hocking. She got a PhD from the University of North Dakota. She taught for a while in, uh, in a university program up in New York, and now she's uh, the head of all the uh, JetBlue Pilot Gateway programs. So uh, it's my pleasure at this point to introduce Nancy, and Nancy, it's over to you. Well, thank you so much, Captain Tui. Uh, thank you, Marianne, for inviting me this evening, and it's great to, to be here to talk to all of you. Um, you know, it's really exciting to be able to hear about what's happening in Jacksonville and to hear the positive um, an optimistic approach to uh, flight training, to becoming a, a professional in the aviation industry. Because I'll tell you, even though things are a little gloomy now, I'll say the future does look really bright. So I too am really excited about it and happy to, to talk with all of you. So if you have questions throughout, um, I think somebody's monitoring the chat. Um, I'm happy, Marianne, to either take them as we go or at the end. But um, in case anybody has those, I'm happy to answer them. So I, I did want to start tonight just to talk a little bit about what is happening. Uh, people read the news, social media, lots of stories out there of what's happening in the aviation industry. Uh, we use the term unprecedented, which I am uh, I'm basically sick of that word. It, it is indeed an unprecedented time, but, but it's an accurate definition of where we are because honestly, as an industry, we've had our ups and downs, you know, no pun intended there, um, but it's never been quite like this. Uh, even 9-11, 19 years ago, which was uh, certainly a devastating time for our industry, um, things now are different. Um, and, and it's tough. It's been hard across the board. We All the airlines have cut capacity um, in an effort to conserve cash, uh, preserve jobs, and, and do, do the best we can with a reduced demand. Um, parking airplanes, some of you may have seen pictures again on social media um, of just uh, a desert full of airplane tails. And, and while those pictures are pretty neat, they're obviously not what we want to see. It's much more fun to see an airplane in the sky. Um, so it's a difficult time and that, that certainly is the truth. I won't sugarcoat that. However, what I'm going to say about the airline industry is that even in difficult times, we find our way to bounce back because we truly are resilient. And to be honest, I think that we are starting to head in the right direction. It's slow, it's tiny little steps, but if every week we can report that we're flying a few more airplanes, a few more routes, 
um, people are in the sky a little bit more, that's a step in the right direction. So what you might be hearing about is, is on the news, what's gonna come back first? What are we gonna see with the different uh, large carriers out there? And I think the general consensus right now is that leisure travel will return first. People are, are at home, they're stuck at home, maybe don't wanna be there anymore, wanna go see friends and family when they feel that it's safe to do so. So we're hoping that as we look at uh, holiday bookings moving into 2021, uh, that you'll see the leisure travel come back. Now, uh, the great uh, improvements in technology like this means that maybe business travel isn't going to come back as quickly. Uh, but as a lot of experts have discussed, there really is nothing quite like a handshake to seal a deal. So even if right now it's not, um, it, it's not high on priorities for, for companies, we do think we'll see the business travel come back as well. Uh, I can tell you at JetBlue, I can't speak for any of the other airlines, but I can tell you that in situations like this, we like to take full advantage of the possibilities going forward. And you might have heard that we announced that we're starting service to London next year. That's still in the plans. We're really, really excited about that. Uh, JetBlue is great at, at being a market disruptor, uh, bringing our great product to places that have never seen it before at a much better cost. Um, so that's still in the, in the cards for next year. We are also bringing in a new aircraft fleet type, the Airbus A220, um, and we take our first delivery of that soon. In fact, we just got a, a brand new simulator at our uh, JetBlue University, our training center in Orlando. And in fact, that simulator was certified by the FAA completely virtually, which was utilized amazing technology to get that done. Um, so that just shows you that we're, that we're headed in, in that good direction. Um, we announced new routes at JetBlue. We're doing what we call connecting the dots, cities that maybe we wouldn't ever have flown between before, now we're doing. Um, so it's, it's a good time to harness those opportunities and try to, to lead the charge moving forward. Uh, I can tell you another great change. If anybody's gone flying in recent months, uh, you probably have noticed that airplanes have never been as clean as they are now. Um, you could eat off those seats. And it's, it's amazing, and I'll tell you that those changes are here to stay. Um, and there have been some recent studies showing that between the cleanliness of the airplanes, uh, the hospital grade HEPA filters on board, and the systems that refresh the air every couple of minutes, uh, the, the odds of actually getting COVID on an airplane are really, really slim. In fact, one study showed that if middle seats are blocked and everyone is wearing masks and all those systems are in place, it's, I think they said, one in 7,700 chance. So I like those odds. Um, I like clean airplanes um, and I feel very safe getting on ours. So that's a positive thing to talk about there too. So my, my whole purpose for sharing this information is to let you all know who are, are joining us tonight um, that this is actually a really good time to consider a career in aviation, whether you're looking to become a pilot, looking to become uh, working in the management field, something else, whether it's uh, commercial aviation, uh, general aviation, corporate, lots of opportunities out there. Uh, you may have all heard, uh, we probably had a discussion in, in past years about the pilot shortage that we, we have been facing. And I, I'm here to tell you that from where I sit, we might have delayed it a little bit, but it's still going to come. And in fact, um, with all the retirements that's happening in our pilot ranks, you'll find that we might have pushed it a couple years down the road, but we're going to hit it really hard. And so people that are joining the industry now are setting themselves up for great success because if you're starting to train, you're starting to get your education. By the time you graduate, build your time, build your experience. By the time you're ready to join an airline like JetBlue, um, we will be hiring and, and excited to welcome you in. So lots of, lots of great things happening in the future. Um, and speaking of future, I did wanna touch upon the JetBlue University Gateway Program that Captain Tui mentioned before. Jacksonville is indeed one of our partners and one of our great partners and uh, our programs across the board are going strong. And for those who are unfamiliar, the JetBlue University Gateway Program 
identifies wonderful talent in still in college. So for us, we look for roughly junior, senior year um, after pilots have completed a, basically their instrument rating. And we go through a selection process, we interview, and if you are chosen, we do hand you that conditional job offer. And I always tell our students, follow our pathway and don't mess up, don't get into trouble, and you have a job waiting for you when you hit about 2,500 2, hours of uh, total time. So if you're interested, I know it's not on here, but the best website to go to for that is pilots.jetblue.com. You can read all about our university gateway and find out more information about that and send an email and ask questions and, and it'll come to me and my team. So I think that hits my 10 minutes there, Marianne. Are there any questions that I haven't seen here or anything anybody wants to know before I pass it on to the next speaker tonight? So I do have a, uh, a question. It is really about, it's more about the gateway program for students and specifically what can students be doing to differentiate their resumes and themselves during that application process with JetBlue? That's a great question. Um, and I, I love getting that question because, you know, one of the things I like to tell uh, students is we're not hiring you because you're good at flying an airplane. We're hiring you because you make good decisions and you're going to be a future captain for us. So we want to know that you have what it takes to make good decisions, think critically, and be a leader. So if there's anything that you can do to show us that you have the potential for all those things, that's really something that can make you shine. So whether you're involved in a, an on-campus group, Women in Aviation, OBAP, um, NGPA, any, any other leadership, NIFA, um, any of those organizations, that's a great thing. Or if you're not involved on campus, maybe you're involved in community service, something you know, with a church group, with some sort of organization um, at home that you are involved in, just to show that there's more to you than just your stick and letter skills. That's what we're looking for. Wonderful, thank you, Nancy. We really appreciate your perspective and um, you coming on tonight to talk about JetBlue. And obviously there's some future paths for our current students. Um, this is a great segue into um, introducing a current flying fin. Uh, we have senior Haley Helms on the call tonight. Um, one of our feedback from our alums was that they wanted to hear from what current students um, are doing on campus right now and what it means to be a School of Aviation student in 2020. So Haley is very accomplished. Um, she is involved all over campus and I'm really looking forward to passing the mic to her so she can tell us a little bit more about the day in the life of an aviation student. Haley? Hey, thank you. Thanks for having me tonight. I'm really honored to be here with y'all to talk about everything, so thank you. Um, so I grew up in Peachtree City, Georgia, very much around aviation, where basically like every other neighbor is a pilot or involved in aviation in some way. Plus my dad flew for American and my mom is a pilot for Delta currently on the A330. So that helped a lot too. And around freshman year of high school, I did my first flight and now I'm halfway through CFI. Um, I chose JU because of the smaller class sizes and the flight program. And everyone at the flight school was so welcoming and it just instantly felt like home. And I couldn't say that about some other schools that I visited really. Um, all of the aviation school or aviation courses are especially designed to make us prepared to the max for the commuters. For example, our jet transition course lets us be hands on the CRJ 700 SIM and learn checklist flows, of aircraft procedures and systems and CRM and many other tools. So it's not such a, like a shock later on. Um, JU School of Aviation, like they're always evolving, like all the gateway programs um, like, to provide its best, like the best opportunities to its students. And last year, JU became a Delta Rappel partnership school. So basically we fill out a pretty extensive application. They send you an email if you're selected, and then you fly out to the Delta headquarters in Atlanta, where you take a behavior and cognitive computer test, which then narrows down the pool of candidates again. And then finally, you have an interview with Delta representatives and ask you a lot of scenario questions to understand your personality more as well as about your flying experiences and involvement in school and just everything. And this is uh, this interview is like huge because this counts as your Delta interview. So if you're selected after the interview, you're partnered with a mentor and that helps guide you in your decisions until you're a Delta one day. Um, and the propelled program doesn't like shortcut the qualifications that you need. It's just a qualified job offer, job offer. So we still have to hit all the points qualifications that other pilots do. 
Um, but if we hit all the checkpoints um, and continue getting the qualifications and hours we need, then we're guaranteed a spot in the new hire class if they're hiring when we finish reaching all of those milestones. And of course, I have to talk about Corona. Luckily, I haven't really noticed a huge difference in our ability to learn through the pandemic, especially in upper level aviation courses, because the class sizes are so small already to begin with. Um, so we are able to social distance in class, wear masks, everything like that. And I, I could see it like affecting lower level classes maybe more because they tend to be more full. Um, but if it's a bigger class, like I'm in Captain Ziskel's class right now and we have around eight people, but we need, and we needed to use a CRJ 700 sims on the computers, which we only have like four of them. And so he just split up the class into two sections. So half of us would go on Tuesday, the other half would go on Thursday. And then the class or the group that was at home, we would just like watch videos or like read articles. So we're more prepared for a class. Um, and like the following week. Um, like Captain Tui was talking about, like so many other flight schools throughout the country had to shut down for Corona, but it, like L3 handled it extremely well, made us feel super safe. And instead of coming to the airport an hour early to do our takeoff data card and stuff like that, we just did it at home. And then we would show up uh, to the airport 30 minutes prior to our flight block. And we get our temperature checked at the door and we wear a mask at all times up until when we're in the plane. And Every safety measure they've implemented has made me feel really safe and cared for because they want our training to progress, progress as quickly as possible while being smart about it. And I really appreciate that because I want to <laughs> progress it too. <laughs> and overall, I'm just really glad that I picked JU because everyone in the School of Aviation really cares for their students and it shows through their actions, especially in the pandemic, as well as the thought that goes into each and every class. And I know for a fact that I'm going to leave JU like most prepared for any future job. Really thankful. Thank you. Thanks, Haley. Will you um, tell everybody on, on the call tonight what these pictures are that we have on the slide? Oh yeah, this is me and my mom on the left. She's in the Zoom with us right now. We were at the Delta Sims. We're in the 3.30. And let me see what the other one is. Oh, that's me and the Seminole in the middle. And oh, my mom and I, we got to fly a Stearman and oh, I forgot the other one. She was in the other one. You can probably my mom, she's in here, she'd probably tell y'all, but, um, and it was just a random thing. I just, I just flew down to, for the weekend and she was like, we're going to go fly these planes right now. I was like, okay. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, thanks Haley. Um, I know I have a question for you that we'll, we'll do at the end of the call, but we really appreciate you being here tonight and kind of giving us that student perspective. Um, and I know our other families also enjoy that as well. So, um, next, our next speaker is Captain Wayne Ziskel. Um, he is an associate professor here at the School of Aviation. He spent 20 years um, in the U.S. Air Force and Air Force Reserve before he went to work at American Airlines for 35 years. He teaches a wide range of system and professional pilot courses here for our students, and I look forward to passing the mic to him. He is going to talk a lot about a couple of the collaborations the school is doing and how the curriculum has changed. Captain Ziskel? Thank you very much, Marianne. I appreciate it. Um, I'm going to start this off very briefly by going through each professor that we have at the school and what they're doing. Rhett, uh, Professor Dr. Rhett Yates asked me to pass along that he is uh, still plugging along on the aviation ec uh, economics courses and management courses and the facility uh, um, sustainability courses that he teaches, doing a great job with all of that, basically mostly for our aviation um, majors who are non-pilots. Uh, Professor Alix Mal uh, Malcioni is uh, pretty much carrying the water for a lot of the licensed courses and teaches aviation weather, has done a remarkable job. She's also our chief pilot. And uh, as Captain Tui said, she's done a super job with the recruiting. In fact, I'm gonna blow to Captain Tui's horn as well. This, uh, this well, I've been here 10 years now uh, in this program. And uh, the, uh, we have done an incredible job of very specific targeted expansion. We could very easily have opened things up and said, anybody come on in, have a great time, and we'll double the students. We'd have too many delays in flight instructors. We, we just couldn't do it. So it's been a very targeted and strategic expansion at about 20% per year since Captain Tui took over here. And, uh, uh, we, uh, the, the people that are in place in this program, I just marvel at the talent. I'm just incredibly impressed with everything. And both the Leaks and Captain Tui deserve a lot of credit for what's going on here. 
Um, so having said that, uh, you've seen the video with, uh, with uh, 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 Professor Ross Stevenson. He does a lot of work with the drones program, OSEARCH, and a lot of cross-discipline use on the campus. He was also the instigator in, in getting the two Redbird Sims, and he also put those puppies together and did a, does a great job with that. Uh, Dr. Masson, uh, Angela Masson, I knew her at American. Actually, I gave her a check ride. We smile about that on occasion. But uh, uh, she's teaching Systems 3 course, the Jet Transition course, and a couple of other licenses courses, uh, licensed courses. Uh, the two uh, big changes we've had in the last uh, couple of years have been the introduction of the G1000. As Captain Tui said, we are now, instead of starting you off on round dials and going then to the Cirrus and then going to the Seminole, where you'd have three separate navigation type uh, systems, which boggles my mind just to even think about it. We, now we're G1000 with everything. We start people off on the G1000 Cessna 172S model, and they take that all the way through uh, CFI and double I. The only difference, obviously, is going to the multi-engine in the Seminole, which also has a G1000. So we start everybody off in the G1000 and we keep them there and, what, and we have uh, specific things that we use for, for training aids in the G1000. We have the Redbird Sims, of course. We have a flash drive from Garmin that uh, you can buy and you can upload it to your PC computer. And you, it's an interactive G1000 simulator. You can do an actual flight planning in there. You can do the flight in there all on your, on your PC. It's pretty amazing. And we also use, right now, we use the King videos. Uh, I just had a phone call from Garmin today. They're going to, they're asking us to beta test a new PowerPoint program they're putting out for their G1000, G1000 teaching. So we'll have a look at that. But other than that, that's the program. The other, uh, the other uh, course that, uh, that we introduced, uh, Haley uh, uh, graciously talked about it. Um, we had, we're, we're great at, we were great at teaching licensed schools. We were great at teaching um, human, some human factor stuff. We were great at system, uh, teaching system stuff. But when we had people come back on the campus, they said, yeah, but you never really told us what it's like to be an airline pilot, like bidding and hotels and layovers and who pays for that stuff. And how do you get from the airport to the hotel? And you know, what's, this, what's, what's all this other stuff about unions and all that? So we put together a course called the Air Transportation for the Professional Pilot. We really touch on all of the things that we don't touch on uh, in, in many of the other uh, schools and uh, courses that we have here. Um, we talk, we use, we, we incorporate an air transport pilot book, which essentially is the air transport uh, ground, pilot ground school, as well as touching international flying unions, um, a week in the, a day or a week in the life of an airline pilot, and uh, you'd be you'd be shocked at some of the questions we get. They're actually, I never even thought about it until people ask the questions. It's pretty amazing. But that's it for our for uh, some of the program developments. I'm going to uh, just take a few minutes, if you'll allow me to, since the mic is not on mute for me. I'm going to be allowed to. Uh, I'm going to put my mentor hat on here. Uh, for our aviators uh, who and future aviators who are in the program here, but specifically the people who are now flying. I know it looks pretty dark out there. And trust me, in 35 years, I, I've written down a list. I'm not going to bore you with it, but it's about a page long of all the things that went on uh, during my 35 years that were initially uh, looked like very dark, impeding prog uh, progress and a way not to go forward, but to go backward. And I'd like to basically say the, obviously the airline industry is dynamic. If you're not going forward, you're going backward. I mean, that's just the way it works. It's a cyclical business. So let me, as we, as we pilots look at anything for a plan B, such as an alternate, let me look at a plan B for you. And what does that mean? If I had some of you in my office, which I have uh, on, uh, in, on the past, uh, in the past, I would tell you that you're only a ladder climb or a chainsaw accident away from trying to find another job. And we can actually use this, this uh, experience we're going through in the industry right now as a way to say, well, you know what? Maybe it is time to look for an alternate way of improving my life just in case something happens to my job and my seniority number and my profession and my company. So I put together just a few things I'd like to chat with you about. One of them is, do you want to are, you, are you employed in the airline? 
with this going on? Are, are you one of the people that is still employed? If you are and you want to stay in the business, look for something else to do in the company that is not necessarily driving the pointy end of the shiny things. Look for some committees you can be on. Look at some union work. Look at any committees, and Delta is great at this with their first officers, because I expect everybody who's with the airline right now who's listening to me is going to be a captain within 10 years. I mean, if you, we're talking mostly to recent graduates here, probably. And I expect this will be over once we get a vaccine and we're going to move on. And uh, I echo the, uh, uh, the JetBlue uh, sentiments. We're, we're going to move on very well from this. But this might be a wake-up call to ask you to think about something else. We have a lot of pilots come in and say, gee, I'd like to do what you're doing someday. And my first question to them is, do you have a master's degree? And they say, well, no. And I said, well, there's your first problem because you need that. If you're gonna teach any undergraduate people in a classroom in this country, um, they pretty, the institutions pretty much require that you have at least a master's degree. So if you've got some downtime right now, which is a nice way of putting it, think about a master's degree. Uh, you've got a great, basis in the School of Aviation and the college, and excuse me, the uh, Davis College of Business, you might want to get an MBA. I mean, you can do anything online these days. You can be sitting in a hotel room in Tokyo getting a master's degree online. Trust me, I've, I've worked on this. You can do this. It's not difficult. It just takes a commitment. If you want to stay in the business and maybe do some other flying other than your airline job, um, Keep your CFI current. That also is another thing that you would do. You work real hard to get that CFI. Keep that thing current. It doesn't take much. A one-time shot with American Flyers, and, and that's, you only pay one fee, and then you can renew every two years online by going through some courses. It's not hard. But it sure beats having a check ride when you have to go back and renew it when you, when you dropped it. If you're going to think about corporate flying, be very careful here because your airline may not allow you to do any corporate flying. Remember, everything you do other than guard and reserve flying goes toward your quarterly, monthly, and annual maximum for commercial pilots. So you have to be very careful about that. Um, I've had pilots ask me, hey, I'm with the airline, but can I go join the guard of the reserves? Of course you can. And uh, you can certainly go, I mean, you can even go active duty military if you chose to do that. The airline will give you time off to do that and protect your seniority number. So get that graduate degree if it's something you might be interested in. I've also some of the most, uh, as I wrap up here, some of the most successful people that I had a chance to work with in the airline industry used their time off when they were junior or looking or furloughed or somehow uh, their job was not exactly what they thought it was going to be to say, you know what, maybe I'd like to get something, do something else outside of the airline industry. And there are people who are running retirement for uh, retirement uh, investments for other pilots who got their Series 7 licenses, their investment licenses, all of those things during the time that they were actually employed. Uh, you can uh, certainly do that. You can, I, I know people who've gone to law school. Uh, I know flight, I mean, now it's not the same thing, but I know flight attendants who've actually become doctors. You can do all of these things either inside or outside of the airline profession. And I would highly recommend that you have a plan B or an alternate. And this is a good wake up call. I, I as I said, I expect everybody to be back doing what they're doing. Um, the airlines have uh, uh, offered early retirement packages to a lot of their senior pilots. Uh, they've put a lot of people on half pay and uh, for, for right now, and they've retired older fleets. But when this thing bounces back, it's gonna bounce back with a vengeance. And I, I expect leisure travel to come back. I expect international travel to open up when, people, when uh, the different countries get the vaccines to do that. Business travel may be a little slower, but it's gonna come back. It's gonna come back. So having said all that, um, that was my spiel and I'm sticking to it. So uh, I'm going to introduce now uh, the Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association Florida representative or Florida ambassador representative, Jamie Beckett. And, it, and I met Jamie a couple of weeks ago. We have a flying club down here in St. Augustine and he came and spoke to us because we, we're a brand new flying club. And I, I, I loved his enthusiasm uh, for all things aviation. And what I asked him to speak on 
to any to uh, to you all is the concept of having other career fields in aviation that are not necessarily wearing four stripes. So Jamie, welcome. Thank you, Captain Ziskel. I appreciate it. And I, I got to tell you, I feel right at home with you tonight. As a graduate of Com Air Aviation Academy, which, as Captain Tui said, became L3 Harris, I feel pretty well connected to Jacksonville University's aviation program. Now, as a couple of folks have mentioned, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, it may appear that aviation as an industry is in trouble layoffs and furloughs and canceled flights, et cetera. But if we look at the industry in the context of history, it becomes clear that looks can be deceiving. Truthfully, it's always been difficult to see the future as it relates to aviation. And that's because technology marches on, changing aviation in the process. The result is, fortunately for us, aviation continues to become not just more ubiquitous in the world, but more necessary to the economies of the world. Nations used to be separated by weeks or months due to the size of the oceans that had to be crossed by ships. Now they're separated by no more than a few hours, thanks specifically to aviation. And that's changed the way business is conducted and economies moved. It's also opened the door to more opportunity in the aviation industry than ever before. Let me give you an example, Apple computers. Apple does what's called just-in-time manufacturing, unlike the old model where factories would produce as much product as they possibly could, ship it out to all their distributors and wait for it to sell. With just-in-time manufacturing, they build products that are already sold. They're all, by the time the phone you bought on Monday online gets to the store on Wednesday, it's already there to be picked up. Most of the product in those Apple stores worldwide will be gone three days from now. Apple products are primarily assembled in China, but they're sold worldwide. Because of just-in-time manufacturing, the speedy delivery of those products means products are often delivered by air. Every day, there are wide bodies coming out of Hong Kong filled with nothing but Apple products. That new iPhone or iPad or MacBook can be anywhere in the world in one day. And that same method of manufacturing or shipping means critical parts for any kind of machinery can be, transport, can be transported from anywhere in the world to anywhere in the world in only a matter of hours, not days or weeks. Now, when I was a little kid in the late 50s and early 60s, that's what was often considered to be the golden age of air travel. My first commercial flight was in 1963 with Eastern Airlines, if any of y'all remember that. In an aircraft that was powered by four big radial engines turning stubby, fat, four-bladed propellers. There was no GPS. There was no ADS-B then. Navigation was done by VOR and NDB, technologies we rarely use for long-distance navigation today. And the flight, can, the flight crew included four members, a pilot, a co-pilot, an engineer, and a navigator. Now, the introduction of inertial nav systems did away with the navigator position. Later, automation and computerized processes did away with the flight engineer. Those changes left quite a few pilots and future aviation professionals thinking aviation's best days were behind them. Maybe as people think now about COVID, but that wasn't the case. Now, although most airliners are crewed by only two people, a captain and a first officer, there are more pilots flying commercially than ever before. It's technology that makes the expansion of aviation possible. And if I'm right in my guess, it'll continue to be for the inexorable growth for the rest of my career, unless of anybody else's that gets involved. Golden as that era might have felt back then, 50 years ago, our options for flying jobs were actually fairly limited. That was true for many positions in aviation, not just pilots. Pilots and ground crew applicants had to be the right age, the right gender, the right ethnicity, with the right background. And then, only then, would they be considered for employment. Today, that's all changed. Airline jobs like those at JetBlue that Nancy spoke about are still often considered to be the gold standard for those who want to work in aviation. And by the way, if you've never been to JetBlue U in Orlando, it's a treat. That place is amazing. I have just loved my time there. Finding a career position with a company as forward thinking as JetBlue is a great opportunity. But there are a whole slew of other options that can be equally appealing, both inside and outside the cockpit. 
Working for a freight operator used to be considered a second tier employment option. Today, operators like FedEx, UPS, Atlas, and Kalita Air have made the freight operator a really desirable option with competitive pay, unique opportunities, and no interaction with irate passengers or crying babies. Sorry, Nancy. They operate everything from Cessna caravans up to wide body Boeings and Airbuses. Some crews travel international, others rarely leave their home region. Aviation is constantly in a state of change, but for many of us, it's clearly changing for the better. Corporate aviation does continue to become ever more popular. Ironically, that's at least part of because the COVID crisis right now. For a growing number of executives, climbing aboard an aircraft with a handful of coworkers may be more appealing of an idea than climbing aboard an airliner filled with 200 random passengers. But of course, corporate aviation works from an economic standpoint too. It's expensive for a half dozen executives commute an hour away to a class Bravo airport while they'll wait another two hours for their flight to part and then have to commute from the destination airport to the nearby city where they have business. A corporate flight department can move all six executives more efficiently and often more cost effectively than a commercial carrier can. As a result, corporate aviation, part 91 operations, They've become a competitive, highly attractive employment option for a wide assortment of aviation professionals, both on the ground and in the air. The key to finding happiness in life in our work is often dependent on finding a career position that fits the lifestyle we hope to live. Certainly there are those among us who wanna fly internationally and those jobs often come with impressive paychecks, but there's also a price to be paid for that lifestyle if it isn't a good fit for us. For some, the price is worth it. They find a career that suits them and brings them real satisfaction. For others, international travel means little more than having to cope with the effects of jet lag for years at a time and long periods of being away from our families. Uh, my dad was a Pan Am pilot for most of my life, and I lived that from the kid perspective. It, my dad had a spectacular career. He flew the press to China when Nixon went. He was on the Pan Am 50 flight that went around the world over both poles. A fantastic career, but he was gone half the time. And that was before cell phones or internet. So he was gone, gone. General aviation offers a wide variety of flying and non-flying positions that can provide the right candidates with a lifetime of rewarding work. In my case, as Captain Ziskel says, 30 years of my flying career, I'm still flying light singles and the occasional twin, and I absolutely love what I do. I'm home more than 300 nights a year. I earn a good living and I have the respect of my flight school classmates, many of whom now serve as captains for major airlines, freight operators, and in some corporate flight departments. But not all aviation jobs keep us in the cockpit. Tom Haynes, AOPA's Senior Vice President of Media Communications and Outreach, made an interesting comment once that has stuck with me. He said, I don't get paid to fly. I get paid because I fly. That's true for me as well. I'm a commercial pilot, single engine land and sea, multi-engine land with an instrument rating, a CFI, a double I, an MEI, an AMP certificate, and a part 107 remote pilot certificate. But I don't get paid to fly. Instead of a company car, AOPA issues me a company airplane, a Cessna 152. I use it as a form of transportation to get around the state. It's not a revenue generator for me. My job involves being an advocate for aviation and aviators. It involves writing and public speaking. I spend a fair amount of my time helping people start nonprofit businesses, such as flying clubs, or teaching them how they might run their flight school more effectively, or showing a room full of rusty pilots how easy it is to get back in the left seat with confidence and confidence. I'm a real live aviation professional, but I don't earn a paycheck for flying anymore, and I haven't in quite a few years. To be honest, for me, aviation has provided an ideal, tremendously diverse career. Over the years, I've earned a living by being a CFI in the cockpit, being an advanced ground instructor in the classroom, working as an AMP, restoring World War II aircraft in a hangar. I've also worked as a writer at Glime Publications, the Red Cover Books, or I've had a column in General Aviation News for over 10 years, written for AOPA Publications and a variety of others, all from my home office. Beyond pilots, and, and we have to remember that pilots are a minority, even in aviation. There's airport administration, there are mechanics and IAs who are not necessarily turning wrenches in the long run. 
there's multiple classifications of engineers. And I don't mean the old flight engineer. I mean aeronautical engineers, aerodynamics, thermodynamics, materials, celestial mechanics, flight mechanics, propulsion, acoustics, guidance and control systems, electrical and human factors, dispatcher services. Down here in Polk County where I am, we have NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration Hurricane Hunters, all based out of Lakeland. And it's not just pilots, there's a whole support staff. And that's to say nothing of drones. And as we probably know, last year, the Air Force flew a drone for the first time from North America to Europe. They're not just those little four prop things that zip out and spot seals and, and sharks anymore. Drones are going to become big, big business. So as you watch the news and you hear stories of doom and gloom, try and keep in mind that these are just short-term hiccups in an otherwise century-old story of aviation industry expansion brought about almost entirely by technological advancement that has led to an economic benefit in every corner of the globe. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate being here with you tonight. Jamie, that was excellent. Thank you so much for your perspective. And I certainly just learned a lot. So thank you so much for hopping on this evening. And Captain Ziskel, I think that the, the point of this call really spurred from the need for some mentorship. So I really loved you going through those points and, and boosting not only the morale of some alums that might be going through a tough time right now, but also educating us on, on what we can do um, collectively and provide for our students and alum as a step forward. So thank you both so much. Um, Speaking of our alumni network, um, we would not be on this call if, if it wasn't 2020 and we should be celebrating the 35th anniversary of the School of Aviation. Um, that anniversary marks um, 1985 when the School of Aviation had their first graduate. Um, we will have this event. It is just postponed. Um, it is a milestone for the School of Aviation and we look forward to gathering again on campus and celebrating that in conjunction with the alumni. Um, annual dinner when it's safe to do so. Um, I know we had a lot of really great plans worked out um, with the School of Aviation and the Alumni Office and we look forward to continuing that partnership. Um, I want to use this time as well to tell the alums on the call um, that we need volunteers. We have two great alumni, um, Blake Myregard and Jimmy Guren, who have already stepped up um, to help us not only connect alums back to the school, but help reach out to classmates, update contact information. And that's the kind of volunteers we need over the next year um, to really keep everyone connected back to the school. If you were interested in getting involved or coming to speak with students, um, this is a great way to do that. Um, for the class that Professor Ziskel talked about, um, providing some feedback, some things you've learned down in the industry that you think it's important for students to know. Um, Chelsea Shackelford, who's on our call, oversees our alumni affinity groups and um, reunions. She is dropping a few links in the chat as we run through this. Um, one of the biggest things that came out of um, a call with one of our wonderful alumni volunteers was the need for a group, a private group on Facebook where alums can come together, share information, connect, start to provide some mentorship for some senior students, um, connect people with careers and opportunities. So that Facebook group is live. Um, please feel free to join it. We are help moderating that. We'll start sharing events in there, um, but please use that as a space to come together as alums. We also will have a reunion web page up until the planning um, is turned into an invitation to come back to, to campus. So feel free to review the reunion web page. Um, email us your stories, email us your photos. Um, that email address is just alumni at ju.edu, very easy. Um, we would love to start to collect things. Um, and keep them on file for the history of the JU School of Aviation as well as share them for the event. I am going to click to the next slide before we, I'm going to talk about a couple of questions that have come in, but this is the Aviation Alumni Network. Um, we've got alums speaking to students during Alumni Career Couch. We've got the dinner last year that was held in the Frisch Welcome Center. I'm pretty sure this is a selfie sent in from some pilots um, mid-flight. And I know, for instance, Professor, um, Alix, who's on the call, has run into aviation um, alumni while out there flying. So keep in touch with us. Keep in touch with the professors you know. Um, we would love to, to see more of you and definitely want to tip our hat to Captain Ziskel and give him the floor to, to ask one of the questions, which is, how did the Aviation Alumni Network start? Um, we know that you kind of took this initiative on three years ago. I think it was in 2017. And, and why did you do that, Captain Ziskel? Well, thank you for that. Um, 
I never expected that question again, but okay, we'll go with that. <laughs> Uh, I grew up in England. Uh, my dad was with International Harvester. And uh, uh, when I was there, we went, I went to a boarding school over there in my formative years. And I still keep in touch with many of those people, uh, good friends of mine. And um, I actually go to England. I used to go once a year for the reunion dinner before the COVID thing and see my friends. And um, I found it to be a very good uh, avenue, not only to keep up with people, but I saw people sharing their professional experiences and contacts and it became a something i would i thought would be would fit very well here i went to the university of illinois before i went in the air force we never had anything like that and we could have used it because there were an awful lot of people in that program who um, could have used professional contacts and keeping up with friends we never had anything when we graduated we all went to the four winds and that was the end of it so uh, you know, people would call on occasion uh, 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 when uh, Captain Harrison was here or B.J. Smith. He would get they would get calls from people that they've taught. And I said, well, why don't we somehow get all these people together? So on a regular basis, so we could actually try to get some organization here. And that was really it. Uh, the, you know, the people who come to JU and graduate from JU and have a good experience here, which I hope is most of them, actually have a real affinity for this place. And they don't necessarily want to let those strings go. And this is a good way to keep everybody in contact. So that was the genesis of it, uh, Marianne. So there we are. Thank you. All right, I'm going to stop screen sharing here for the remainder of the call. I have a few questions that came in. Um, but if you have anything that you want to ask, feel free to put it in the chat to any of tonight's speakers. Um, or if you're an alum and want to come on and just say hello or a family um, that has a current student in the School of Aviation, please feel free to do so. Um, but the first question that I have is for Haley. Haley, you seem to be very involved. How do you balance your, your classes across the university while also being a part of your flight block and all of your necessary items for the School of Aviation? Um, I set a lot of alarms. I have like my whole alarm clock it's like crazy, but uh, yeah, I set up a lot of alarms. I just make sure I have everything written out on my calendar, and it's just I, I've pretty been pretty much in, like I've involved like in a lot of stuff throughout my life, and I feel like my parents did that to prepare me like on purpose, like just to prepare me for a future. And I feel like it hasn't really been like a huge issue. I've just been used to that forever. <laughs> so, well, that's awesome. Um, another question that came in that. Haley or anybody else from the school aviation can um, answer to is, is the different student organizations that exist that are um, typically have faculty advisors from the School of Aviation. I know we have women in aviation. We have organization of black aerospace professionals, Alpha Eta Rho and the flight team. Can you talk about the importance of that kind of programming for our students, either captains of school, Captain Dewey, um, I think that's who's on the call or Haley, feel free to jump in too. Or I don't mind answering. Or Alix, yes, Alix, welcome. Hi, um, I'm actually the faculty advisor for Women in Aviation as well as OBAP. Um, being part of organizations is very important. I tell our students that you know, in college, you pretty much have a blank uh, type of canvas for your resume, and that being a pilot, like Nancy was saying at the beginning, is not really what's going to make you better. Um, it's everything else that you do on top of flying that is going to make you a great leader. Um, so being part of your, uh, of the, you know, being part of all the organizations and becoming involved, um, you know, making fundraisers and going to all the uh, conferences and annual, you know, conventions. Um, that's how you meet a lot of people. That's how you get internships. Uh, that's how you make connections because like I tell all my students, you know, the aviation is a big little world. Um, everyone knows everyone and, you know, like Captain Tui says, you know, on day one at JU, you become a professional. And so we are going to observe you from day one. Um, so that's why I say, hey, join all the organizations. A lot of our students are heavily involved in many, many organizations. And we actually have tons of aviation related organizations for such a small program, you know, between the flight team uh, that's being led by Rhett, uh, by Dr. Yates. Um, Alpha Eta Road that's being led by Captain Ziskel, um, you know, uh, Women in Aviation. Uh, we also have the Aviation Ambassador Program. 
it's kind of been dormant this semester since we can be holding any type of events. But, you know, we try to mold our students into becoming leaders, um, aviation leaders, and, you know, joining the organizations is what is going to lead to that. So that's that. Thank you, Alix. Yes. If I could add on to that too, I mean, we also have a lot of aviation students in leadership positions in the university organizations. A lot of aviation students in student government, uh, leadership positions and fraternities and sororities, service clubs, and it's across campus, you know, and uh, I would be remiss if I didn't take the opportunity to point out once again that at JU, the aviation students are smarter, better looking, and a lot cooler than everybody else. Your favorite line. I feel like I've heard that often. Um, I have a question that came in from an alum. Um, he says, what are the gaps in bridging students to the professional world, both flight ops and management, that we as alumni can help with? So I'll address that. I mean, I think part of what makes mentorship so profound an experience is that somebody who's been through it is able to impart that knowledge onto somebody who is where they were however many years before. Um, one of the things that we have with our University Gateway program is a very robust mentoring program and the second somebody's accepted into the program they're paired up with a mentor and it's not just a mentor it's somebody who went to their school. Um, we have a set of pilots from JU that are amazing mentors um, and I can tell you that they start off as mentors and they become like family. So I think one of the best things that you can do as an alumni from JU is to reach back to support somebody who's there now and help them along their way. Um, because that is powerful and meaningful and really, really useful to um, helping success further along. Marianne, if I could echo what Nancy just said, she's absolutely right. Uh, I just worked with a high school student last week, a young girl who wants to be an Air Force pilot, but she knows nothing about it. She doesn't know anybody in the Air Force. And while we were talking, I said, you know, Richard McSpadden, who runs the Air Safety Institute for AOPA, used to be Thunderbird number one. I'll bet he knows something about how to do well in the Air Force. She was blown away that just through a conversation, you could get a connection to someone who had real experience who was willing to share. That networking is so important. And when you've got the commonality of that JU experience, it just makes it better. Thank you both Nancy and Jamie for that. Um, we of course in the alumni office couldn't agree more and we love to have our alums um, come back and provide perspectives, um, especially now with the, with the virtual climate that we're in, we, we know that our aviation alums are around the world and at the drop of a hat, we saw it last year at the alumni dinner, they flew in day of and attended. So um, now that we're here and, and we are dealing with Zoom, I think that it's definitely a wonderful opportunity that if you are interested in getting involved and speaking with students, um, connect with us, connect with the School of Aviation and we'd be happy to facilitate that. Um, I am gonna take last call um, for any questions in the chat, please feel free to drop them in. I just want to say thank you again to the School of Aviation, to Jamie, to Nancy, to Captain Ziskel, to Haley for being here this evening. Um, this was a great program and it's up something we really look forward to sharing out to our alums, parents, and students post-event. Um, if you have any questions about the remainder of the homecoming schedule, feel free to contact us um, at alumni at ju.edu. And we really look forward to seeing everybody again um, on campus soon for the 35th anniversary celebration, hopefully next year. Thank you, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you, everybody, for attending. We really appreciate it, especially you parents. A uh, big part of the program, your students wouldn't be here without you. So thank you very, very much. And Jamie and Nancy, thanks for being part of this. Have a good night, everyone.